Welcome to Down to Business with V, a show dedicated to bringing you actionable information to help protect you, your families, your businesses, and your communities. I'm your host V, and today we're bringing you When Fraudsters Target Your Wealth, Avoiding Investment Scams. We've called in a CEO, wealth manager, and co-founder of an investment platform to share her insight on the issues and offer solutions. And as always, we'll share what to do if you're a victim of fraud. Stay tuned for that and more. Let's get down to business. From Atlanta, Georgia, to becoming a United States Marine, to Washington, D.C., and every place in between, everybody calls me V. My goal is to bring you resources, education, and knowledge from sources you can trust that informs and protects to safeguard our families, our businesses, and the community. Now let's get down to business. Welcome to Down to Business with V. I'm your host, V, and today we're discussing when fraudsters target your wealth and how you can avoid investment scams. We have in the studio with us via Zoom, Jenna Bianca Villa, CEO and co-founder of Savvy. Jenna is an entrepreneur, wealth advisor, and public speaker whose life mission is to positively impact the lives of others. As the founder and CEO of Pearl Capital Management, a holistic, the only fiduciary financial planning firm. She advises on $150 million of assets under management. Jenna also leads the Arcadia team of Geneva Financial, a home loan company powered by humans, showcasing her versatility and expertise in different facets of the financial industry. In her newest venture, Savvy, co-founded with her sister, Jenna aims to create a platform that protects women and their wealth by weeding out predatory salespeople. Here's my interview with Jenna. Welcome, Jenna. So glad to have you today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So Jenna, we're so excited to have you on the show today. You have a multifaceted background in financial services. Tell us a little bit about what you've done before and how it led to the launch of your RA firm as well as your newest venture, Savvy. Yes, it's it's an interesting story now that I'm on the other side of it, but I started my career in finance in the, the Great Recession in 2008-2009. And I spent the first seven years of my career in finance at large financial institutions on the commission side, so on the stockbroker side of this. And after being in this and, and seeing seeing what the financial industry was, I found that there was a better way and uh, we didn't have to charge clients commissions. And that's why I launched my own firm in the RAA space in 2016. Uh, so Pearl Capital Management was born because I wanted to not be in that profits-driven culture anymore. And then from there, I made this name for myself in the Phoenix community that I was this safe place for people to come to if they had been the victim of some something that looked like predatory financial sales. And I thought for a long time that it was just my niche and that's why I saw so many people in this space um, that had been the victim of a crime. And then I started doing more research and I found that 25% uh, of women will be the victim of a financial crime at some point in time in their life. So with that, I was in shock. I realized it wasn't just my bubble. It, it was something that was a, a bigger problem in our country. And I was talking with my sister about it. My sister's whole career is in technology and my whole career is in finance. And so we banded together in late 2022 uh, to put together a fintech company to solve that problem. Specifically for women, uh, we vet out all of the bad actors and we make a safe place where women can connect with a financial professional. Um, and eventually we're rolling out experts in other industries as well, but someone that they know they can trust that's been fully vetted. And so that is the launch of Savvy. And I'm pretty passionate about making sure that we're protecting consumers from bad actors in the industry. Absolutely. And Jenna, I love that you have really focused this um, service, this platform around women, helping women become financially savvy. I was actually talking with a wealth manager um, in the area, works for um, a, a large firm and 
has a substantial, uh, you know, holding under her belt. And she talked a lot about the same thing that women generally tend to um, delegate the authority or, you know, the decision making when it comes to their investments, their portfolios. Um, and how they're they're allocating their funds. Um, so it's nice to see that there's some safe place for women to go to find information. So tell us specifically about this service, how it works, um, and, and how women would approach this platform and what they could hope to gain from it. That, that's a good question. So in, in empowering women, it's a twofold process. It's connecting them with people they can trust, and also educating them to ask the right questions and to be empowered and be informed. And so from the education standpoint, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are already amazing providers out there educating people on financial literacy. And so we have some exciting partnerships that we're, we're launching pretty soon here. So I can't tell you exactly what they are, but they're about to be launched um, and we'll be announcing those, those pretty soon. And then from what our company is doing, Savvy is the name of the company, Savvy Savvy is doing a full vetting process. So we're starting with information that's already available that maybe consumers don't know how to find. So are these people licensed? Are there complaints against them? We're going through and finding that background information and making sure if people are complaining about this advisor, we're not connecting people to them. Uh, specifically our, our women, we're not connecting women to an advisor who has a bunch of complaints against them. And then we're going to do interview processes, um, where we have a female interviewer interviewing the financial advisor, making sure that they are not condescending, that they actually are an educator at heart. We make them sign a contract and an oath that says they're gonna put the best interest of our women consumers above their own. And so it's a pretty lengthy vetting process to get onto the Savvy platform. But once they're there, our women know that this is someone that they can trust with their finances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I know you just touched on the education process. In, um, in what you do. Talk to us about some of the questions that you'll answer for women as they're coming to the platform. So a big question we get is, where do I start? What do I look for? What questions do I ask? So we actually have compiled a list of questions. These are the things you should be asking when you're interviewing an advisor and we empower them to interview more than one because different advisors and different firms are offering different services, different platforms, different fee structures. So understanding what they are and what questions to ask is, is very important. We make sure to empower our women consumers to feel armed with those questions. We also make them know that it is the salesperson's job. It is the advisor's job to explain things to them. There are no dumb questions. If they don't understand what is being told to them from a financial standpoint, it's actually the advisor's problem, not explaining it well, instead of the woman feeling that it is her problem, not understanding it. So a lot of empowerment goes into our education to make sure everyone feels like they are in the driver's seat of their financial future. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great point too, that if someone is not understanding, it's not the student's fault that they don't understand, it is the teacher's fault that they don't understand. You've gotta be able to explain it in a way that the layperson gets it. Yeah, and, and I think that's so important, not only in that area, but in every area, and specifically what, with what we do here as well. So um, in, our, in our initial interview, you talked about something that was so powerful. Uh, we, were, we were teasingly calling you the anti-Madoff. Tell us about what you're doing um, in your sector, in your area, um, and how, even though there are still stories of people being victims of fraud, Ponzi schemes and things like that, um, what you're doing and any additional insight you have on this because it is still happening. Yes, and, and I'd like to point out that everyone knows to look out for the high pressure salesman, the, the used car sales stereotype of the past. That is not what fraudsters are doing today. That's not what Madoff did. Madoff was very much condescending. He had a big ego. He had a um, this exclusive thing that people felt like, I don't understand it, but I want to get into it. That's what the fraudsters and the predatory salespeople are doing today is they're being, they're talking to investors in a way. You don't get it, they get it, and you just need to trust them. And so educating people to ask questions, to feel informed, to not have a modern day made up talk down to them in a way where they feel like they just need to trust them because they know more than them. That's a, a big, um, a big passion project of mine to just make sure that we are educating consumers 
to be in the driver's seat, to ask questions, to not just accept some some condescending person, tell them that they don't know, and just to trust them. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, you know, uh, we were looking at over the last few years this thing called pig butchering scams, where um, you know, especially specifically with cryptocurrency, these fraudsters would come in, build these relationships with people, show them, you know, just casually some investments, tell them essentially what you said, hey, look, I, look I'm look, i the expert on this. I know more than you just trust me. Go ahead and put $2,000 here. Go ahead and put $3,000 here. And they would you know, do a pump and dump is what they call it. Um, take their money, show them some initial return so that they put more money in and then take off with it, um, leaving them without you know any recourse. Um, so I love that you've made it a a not only uh, you know something that you do professionally, but really carrying a torch and a banner in everything that you do to ensure that consumers are protected, women are protected, and and that you know our our wealth is protected. You know, because that's not just money; that's people's lives and livelihoods. I. I couldn't agree with you more. And I actually have a friend who's a, a prominent realtor in, in the Phoenix community that had a, something happen to her that looked really similar to that crypto scam you were just talking about, where someone had hacked into her social media and was was pretending to be her. Um, so So a digital identity theft, if you will, and telling other people just trust me, buy this crypto. You've trusted me to buy houses before. You trust me with your investments. Just trust me. That same language. But it was through digital identity theft. And and through her social media, they were able to scam her friends and her family. And she did nothing wrong. She just got hacked. But now she is the face of this crime that her friends and family have lost a lot of money because of. So, um, there are fraudsters in all different ways and all different lights lights so i would really just warn everyone that it's not just the bernie madoff that's sitting in front of you there are so many different scams out there and to really just ask questions yeah great point great point well when we come back we will talk more with jenna biancaville about how to protect your wealth and your assets and how to avoid being a victim of an investment scam we'll be right back Welcome to Down to Business with V. I'm your host, V, and today we're discussing how to protect your wealth and how to avoid being a victim of investment scams. I have in the studio with me via Zoom, Jenna Biancaville. She's a wealth advisor and has an extraordinary background in finance, and she's here to offer some insight with us today. Welcome back, Jenna. Thank you for having me, V. Yes, absolutely. So you shared a lot in that first segment, and we're gonna continue diving deep um, and offering our viewers some of your expert uh, advice and insight on how to avoid being a victim of scams. Now, you know, what's interesting, Jenna, is that you talked in our pre-interview about uh, addressing regulators regarding uh, when there are lawsuits on their behalf um, that they're made whole and the, the um, inclination or the thought is that generally if, if a person or an organization is sued on behalf of an individual or a group of individuals, one would assume they get a piece of that pie. You told us differently. Tell us more about that. Yes, I, I was actually down at our state capitol advocating for the consumers. It, as I already shared, I am a, a big advocate for protecting our consumers. And it, it doesn't always happen through regulation. But as I was down there and we were talking about the regulators fining financial institutions, I did point out to the regulator that not all of those fines that are imposed are used to make the consumer whole. And while 
I have no problem if they would like to fine banks and institutions above and beyond the damages that were done to the consumers. Uh, I do have a, a big passion for making sure the consumers are made whole first before the government goes ahead and pockets some of that money into their general fund. And this was an interesting conversation I had with a regulator because he didn't fully understand what I was saying. He said, well, I don't get the benefit from that money or my department doesn't get the benefit from that money. It goes to this general fund. And and what I was advocating for was the consumer actually being made whole. And there are several instances uh, where that, that didn't happen. So the 2000, 2008, 2009 uh, financial crisis, there were lots of fines on banks on everything that happened, but those consumers who lost those, their homes and were harmed were not made whole. And even the most recent Wells Fargo um, big fines that happened in, I think it was, was it 2014 or 2016? Um, the consumers were not made whole for some of, some of the fraud that was happening there either. So something that I'm trying to advocate for, getting anything done in regulations takes some time. But there are monies that do go back to, to the consumers, but sometimes they don't get all of their money back. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is uh, for lawmakers say, hey, it's not going into my pocket, it's going into the general fund. Well, if it's not going to the consumer, we don't really care where it's going. Let's get the consumer made whole, as you said, and then you know pocket the rest and, and you know use that to to help uh, regu create regulation or uh, deregulate in some cases where it's needed. Um, but you know to help our government run better. But yeah, let's make our consumers whole. Uh, I found that very interesting when you shared that with me. So thank you for the work you're doing there as well. Um, so, Jenna, we talked about, You're welcome. Um, yes, very, very much so, um, we talked about um, suitable versus non-suitable investments. Talk to us about that and how consumers need to be looking at conversations they're having with their advisors around these sorts of things. I, I love this question. And, and the first thing I want consumers to know is that not all advisors or planners, whether they call them financial planner, financial advisor, wealth advisor, whatever title they give, they give themselves. Um, they're not created equal and they don't charge in the same way. There, there are three main types of ways that these advisors will be charging clients and, and adding their fees to clients. It would be fee only, which would just be a flat percentage fee or a, a flat dollar fee. And then there's fee based and commission based. So if the word is based is in their, their fee structure, uh, it is going to be based on what they choose to do. So a fee based advisor could help you invest $100,000. And if they gave you an ETF that follows an index fund, they might just make 1% for the whole year. So $1,000 for the whole year. But if they sold you maybe an A share mutual fund, they could make $5,000 right now. If they sold you a private investment that wasn't liquid and it was harder to get your money out, they might make 7% or $7,000 right now when they sold it. And if they sold you something highly illiquid, like an annuity, they could make maybe up to 14% right now. So $14,000 in their pocket, a commission they can make off of you if they convince you to buy something that locks up your money or has a lot of fees and wrappers around it. So knowing that there's a conflict of interest in the person that's advising you is something that I really like to empower consumers with because you assume that you trust this professional to advise you on the best thing to do with your money, but they're not all fiduciaries. A lot of times they work for profit-driven companies that are actually incentivizing them to sell the investment du jour. Even some of these insurance companies, uh, they, have an, they have annuity quotas. And if you don't sell enough annuities per month, per year, you don't get to keep your job. So it's more about keeping their job and less about advising their consumers. Wow, that is actually sad to hear, especially in the case of wealth advising. We hear of it in other uh, sectors and other industries where sales are involved and pressures put on people to meet certain quotas as part of their daily jobs. And, and we kind of get why that would be needed. But in an instance like this, where someone's wealth, um, life savings, which equals your time in your life, all those moments you gave up, you know, and all that hard earned time and energy put in to have someone take that and not really invest it with your best interest in mind, but their own and their organization's mm -hmm. quota. Wow, that is sad. There definitely needs to be an overhaul in that regard. 
what what can be done? What do you recommend as an expert? And you know, as a I would say in a consulting capacity, I'm a consultant. What do you say to organizations um, that are operating like this? Well, it can't be regulated away. Uh, I'm in the most regulated industry that we have, or one of the most, and it hasn't worked thus far, uh, which is why I launched Savvy, because if we can't fix it through regulation, then why can't we fix it with capitalism, with women voting or consumers voting with their dollars and saying, we don't want your high commission products. And I'd like to circle back to the original question that you asked. You asked about suitability. And, and so I explained why these different investments have different commissions around them or different, they pay the advisors different fees. Um, but it's the, there is, there are regulations around suitability. So there are rules. And if an advisor took 100% of your net worth and they put it in a highly illiquid asset, uh, I had someone who came to me with this exact situation. She went through a divorce. She got $8 million. That was her half. She had never managed the finances before. She trusted an advisor. He took 100% of her money and locked it all up in illiquid investments that paid really high commissions. She ended up in my office and said, I just want to buy a house. Why does my advisor say I don't have enough money to buy a house? And it's because he put her in products that were not suitable for her. And while they are legal investments, advisors are allowed to sell these investments, we do have regulations against putting people in unsuitable investments. And so if you find yourself not having access to your money, being an, in an unsuitable investment, there are regulations against that. You can report that and there are recourse available for those people. Yeah. Was, was that client in that particular situation able to um, seek any recourse to, to liquidate those funds and be able to achieve her goal of just getting a home, buying a home? So what's difficult and why I'm so passionate about empowering women is that she didn't want to, she liked the guy. He was mm -hmm. a nice guy. She didn't want to mm -hmm. get him in trouble. She didn't want to complain against him. She felt guilty and she felt like she, she just carried the guilt of the bad products that he had sold. And so from the last time I spoke with her, she wasn't ready to file a complaint. Uh, so my my whole goal in, in what I'm doing in my passion around advocacy and around consumer prote protection is to make sure people never end up introduced to that person in the first place. Because I can't convince people to, to file complaints, but I can protect them from never making that introduction in the first place. Yeah, so good thing that uh, we got from that is that number one, there is some sort of recourse that we can rely upon. And number two, Organizations like yours, Savvy, exist so that that introduction to someone who's moving in their own self-interest is never even made. So that's, that's awesome. Um, in the last few minutes that we have, let's talk about some tips to avoid investment scams. We talked about, you know, these uh, self-seeking, self uh, you know, wealth advisors. Let's talk a little bit more about what our, our audience should be looking for and how they can avoid some of these scams that are out there. The, the biggest thing is there are no dumb questions. If you don't understand, continue to ask questions. Around the self-seeking advisors, asking questions about how they make money. And if they say fee-based, that means they get to choose whatever they want. And so the next question you should say is, how do I know when you're doing a flat fee or a flat percentage versus how do I know when you're choosing to make a commission? How do I know the difference here? And will you tell me? Because commissions are baked into the back end of investments. They, those advisors keep their money before you get your returns. You never even see those fees because they're baked into the rate of return. So asking questions ahead of time will make sure that you have, you're fully informed and you have all the information. Uh, how they make their fees, um, where your money is going, what their investment philosophy is. My favorite is, are you a fiduciary? Anyone who's a fiduciary legally must put the best interest of the clients above themselves. And so I just love to see everyone find a fiduciary so that they have to put their best interest first. Yeah. When we look at uh, some of the scams that are out there, like the pig butchering scams, 
where you've got somebody saying, hey, just just trust me, or you know, they're making, um, build, trying to build a relationship with this person and you know, talk them into investing in a product. What would you say to a person that might be in a situation like that? where somebody's already shown them an investment, they're already tempted or have put money out there. What do you say to to a woman or a man in that case um, that's in a situation like this? Most of the people that I've spoken to who were on the other side of the fraud, they, and they're telling me their story, they tell me they knew in their gut it was too good to be true or they knew in their gut that they didn't fully understand and feel comfortable with this person. Uh, So I I know this isn't a very um, scientific answer, but trusting your gut, if it seems too good to be true, if they are promising rates of return, they are not licensed because anyone who's licensed cannot promise a rate of return. And if they are licensed, they're not going to keep their license for long because that's illegal for anyone licensed in finance. So if someone comes in with promises, with guarantees, with something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Trust your gut and know that in investing, we can't promise anything. Absolutely. Trust your gut. I've told my employees that, I've told my friends that, it never ever lies. Jenna Biancaville, thank you so much for being with us. We certainly do appreciate you. Thank you, V, it was great being here. Wonderful. If you or someone you know has been a victim of an investment scam, a data breach, account compromise, deep fakes, or digital impersonation fraud, be sure to contact your local police department or contact the FBI at ic3.gov. And be sure to visit our sponsor, Vicar Group LLC, business consultants for Generation U, at vicargroup.com for cybersecurity awareness training and other resources to protect you, your family, your businesses, and the community. If you'd like to sponsor the show, be a guest on the show, or have show ideas, feel free to contact us at dtbwithv.com. I'd like to thank our crew, Doug, Suzanne, Stephen, David, Zach, and Jen, We couldn't do the show without you. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for watching. I'm your host, V. This is Down to Business with V. We'll see you next time.